Hello, BookTube. You might think, judging by the fact that I have uploaded three 40-minute videos today, that I would be done, that you'd be done with me, and that I would not have the gall to make another video, and yet, here I am. I want to give you a Monday Reads. <laughs> Figure in for a penny, in for a pound. You can watch these anytime you want, or you can not watch them. <laughs> I want to do... Uh, this will be in the nature of my fill-in-the-blank hashtag day read things where I give you uh, some books that I have already read and some books that I'm going to read. I'm going to switch the formula just a bit here and give you first three books that I'm going to read uh, because we just talked about them, so they're, they're, uh, they're very familiar and I don't need to give them much time. Uh, and they are books that I just got in a mail hall. The, the first one is Gods and Robots. This is a... Those of you who didn't watch that video, I don't blame you if you saw its length of time. This is a study of... Uh, how the ancient world, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Romans, viewed technology, advanced technology, robotics, prosthetics, all that sort of thing. And uh, it seems fascinating to me. And I, I feel a little bit guilty because this author's last book I did not like. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes when you when you read everything, you, you have that feeling where I didn't like the author's last book, but I obviously, in the back of my mind, something about that dislike must feel a little unsettled, like maybe I read the book at the wrong time or in the wrong mind frame or wasn't forgiving enough or whatever. Uh, because I feel, in addition to the interest of the subject, I feel like I owe this author another shot. So I'll be I'll be reading this. Uh, so that's one of the ones that I'm going to read. And the next one is this, Are You Okay? This is a practical guide to determining whether or not you need mental health and how to get go about getting the kind you need if you do. So I have a feeling that a lot of this is going to go right by me. Uh, because I don't, I don't require uh, mental health from an expert or medication or therapy or anything like that. And the the prevalent mind frame, and probably I'm wrong to attribute it to this book, but the prevalent mind frame in the 21st century is that no one can say that. That if you say that, it's a, it's a cry for help. It's a it's a, a sign that you need it. It's in, infinitely non. It's infinitely inclusive, no matter what. Everybody is supposed to need it. I don't believe that. I don't think that's true for most people. I think uh, a person who develops a seri uh, an actual mental health condition that requires a trained individual to intervene and care is uncommon. It's, it's as uncommon as uh, the, the physical ailments that are its counterpart. You see people walking around all day long. They, most of them walk around all day long. They don't. It's it's not that every single person you see has a serious health problem. I don't think. I think it's analogous. Uh, we'll see if this book proves me wrong. But one way or another, I think I, I'm probably going to be interested in the uh, in the narration. Otherwise, in this thing, the, the talk about how mental health is viewed in the United States, the stigma attached to it, maybe personal stories if there are any in here. I don't. I think a lot of the practical stuff about you know here are the helplines. Here are the support groups. A lot of that stuff I'm not going to need, so we'll see We'll see how engrossing a read. It might not actually end up being an involving read at all. And then the third thing is a reread. It's The, the Sea Around Us by Rachel Carson. This is uh, just a terrific book. <laughs> just just terrific. And I'm gladly going to read it. I, got, I unexpectedly got a paperback reprint in the mail, so I'm gladly going to reread it. Uh, and then those are the three that I'm going to read. Uh, and now I want to show you the three that I've recently read. And fortunately, all three are recommendations. All of them are. Uh, the first one is enormous, but like I said uh, in another video, I have been overdoing the reading uh, since I got back from my from my uh, unexpected Thanksgiving family vacation. I've been I've been reading like crazy in the last twenty four hours. Uh, but this is one that I had read a chunk of before I left, so it wasn't. It wasn't like I had to get the whole thing done in this time because it's huge. It's this, this is the Kremlin letters, uh, gigantic. Uh, somber volume. This is edited by David Reynolds and Vladimir Pechanov, uh, and it's it's Stalin's letters to all of his Western counterparts, to Roosevelt and Churchill, uh, during World War II, dur the, during the broad era of, of World War II, uh, and it's amazing, absolutely amazing. It it uh, it tells the story of World War II all over again in, in a kind of way, in a sort of executive summary. Uh, the thing that I love most about it, you might look at this thing and the length of it and think, oh my God, it's just a slog through letters. Do I want to keep company with Joseph Stalin for that long? But the thing I loved about it is that the the uh, editorial material, it's, it's really kind of a misnomer, the title and the description on the cover, because it's really... Uh, a history of Stalin's relationships with these other rulers and with the events of his time 
peppered all throughout with letters. It's really not what you think of when you think of a letter collection. There's a huge amount of writing, in other words, uh, by David Reynolds and by Vladimir Pachanov. There's, there's a huge amount of writing. They, they, there's a huge, the, the interstitial narrative, the narrative parts connecting the letters is vast. It accounts for a huge proportion of the length of this book. Uh, so so uh, if, you think, if you're looking at it and thinking, well, I'm not sure that I'm that interested in Stalin's letters, uh, that's not what you're getting in this book. That's certainly not what it feels like to read. It feels like reading just a, uh, a narrative history of the leadership of World War II with a kind of a running commentary reflected in the letters of one member of that leadership. I, I, I'm probably doing a poor job of describing it, but I recommend it. If you're interested in World War II, I recommend it because it's uh, it was much, much more involving than I expected it to be. Uh, and then this next one is, I don't know if we saw it on this channel. It's by, uh, it's by a curator of the Museum of Natural History here in America who has the rather unfortunate name of Lowell Dingus. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, The King of Dinosaur Hunters, The Life of John Bell Hatcher, and the discoveries that reshaped that shaped paleontology. This is a you know mid nineteenth century guy and explorer in the West, part of the giant rush for bones, the dinosaur rush for uh, finding bone deposits and whatnot. And this guy found a whole bunch of them, including some really key ones, and not just dinosaurs, with humans as well. And it's it's a subject matter that I know uh, fairly well because I researched uh, and then reviewed a posthumous novel written under Michael Crichton's name called Dragon Teeth, which is all about two other famous dinosaur hunters. Uh, so I, I had to, I wanted to, it's a thin novel in, in every sense of the word, but I wanted to learn a lot about the subject before I wrote about it, even though I don't think anybody cares. I just am that way about reviews. So, so I read up on a lot of people and this guy's name came up often in my reading. Uh, but I still didn't expect a book about him to be this good. And I, I chalk it up to Lowell Dingus's writing. Lowell Dingus is a fantastic storyteller. Just fantastic. This this never lapses into... I mean, it's a long book. It never lapses into the kind of narrative-killing mega-detail that you would expect would ruin a book about someone you that the author knows perfectly well you've never heard of. How many times, uh, those of you who read... I, I don't know how many of you there are who read uh, off-the-beaten-track scholarly biographies, but so often, biographers who are writing a long life of a figure, again, they know perfectly well you've never heard of, will just just bathe themselves in minutia to the point where you're just gasping for air. I've seen it happen so many times. It happens even with the best of intentions, even in really good books. Uh, where the, because the, the key in a book like this is that the author has to remember at every turn that he's introducing you to this. He's not just telling you this story. This is not a life of Martin Luther or Martin Luther King. This is the story of someone you've never heard of doing all sorts of things you've never heard of, in an environment with pressures, people, superstars, trends, and, thread, and uh, trends that you've never heard of. So the author can't ever lose sight of that. The author of a book like this has to tell the story in addition to writing the book. And uh, like, for instance, uh, just recently, Dermot McCullough's great big book on Thomas Cromwell does that perfectly. The man's the foremost expert in the Tudor era and in the religious upheavals of the Tudor era. But he never forgets his, that his primary obligation is to tell the story in which he will, that the story that he will fill with his own research. Or uh, the that recent biography of uh, Rock Hudson. In fact, I don't even think it's out yet. All That Heaven Allows. Terrific book. They could easily have done the same thing. Most people don't know the details of Rock Hudson's life or career or cinematography. And the author never forgets that. And that makes the book. That, that makes the book work. Uh, and the same thing is true here. Uh, the, you might look at this and think, well, I don't know anything about uh, paleontology. I don't know anything about the, the discovery of the first dinosaur remains and the beginning of uh, a systematic study of dinosaurs. I don't know anything about this person. So, you know, it's not the book for me. Uh, if you're interested in dinosaurs, that's all you need. That'll get you in here. That'll get you all the way. And once you're in this author's storytelling hands, you will be fine because <laughs> he is really good. Uh, and then the last book, uh, I don't. Again, I don't think we ever saw it on this channel, but it's a masterpiece. Just a masterpiece. It's better than the other two. It's just amazing. A towering work of history that's just creeping in to the list under. Yeah, this was due. This came out in mid-November with no fanfare at all. I've scarcely seen it reviewed anywhere in American press. Uh, it's by David Gilmore, and it is the British in India. 
a social history of the Raj. Again, a big thing, a big, a big, heavily detailed thing about what it's. This is not a, a history of the Raj. It ends up being that it, you you can read it as that, but really is it's a study of all aspects of the people who went and made the Raj happen. The British who went out and ran it, supplied it, you know, wrote about it. Every aspect of their lives. Why did they go? And what kind of a world did they find there? Uh, I thought it was just incredible, and not just because of its comprehensiveness. It, it covers the subject. I've read a lot about the Raj, <laughs> a huge amount about the Raj, and I this volume stands with the best of them uh, in in terms of what I've read. It's not just because of how sweeping it is, but again, because of what a great job the author does. He's pithy, he's insightful, he's unforgiving. It's uh, just it's just a masterful performance. I don't know why. It's appearing with so little fanfare. I, I, and I don't know why it's appearing at this time of year. You know, when, when the publisher... Uh, this is for Astros and Jorah? Yeah, this is for Astros and Jorah. They had to know perfectly well uh, that this coming out in mid-November... I, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't matter. This will go to libraries. It will go to schools. Serious historians and, and serious readers of history will find it no matter when it came out. Maybe the awards hoopla and the best of year hoopla doesn't really matter to FSG. Maybe they don't really care. Maybe they shouldn't. That might be good. A book like this will stand the test of time, so it doesn't really need to worry about the Christmas gift-giving season. But nevertheless, it is here in time for that. <laughs> and if you know somebody who's interested in British history, or Indian history, uh, this is the perfect thing to get for them. It's a major outlay of money. I think this is $40. $35. It's a major outlay of money. But, you know, even if that person is you, and you just want to find it at your library, boy oh boy, what a book. Don't miss it. Uh, because it's not just a dry trot through the subject. The author is alive on the page, everywhere, talking about these people, finding the right anecdotes, the right quotes, and not just presenting them as if, isn't that a funny story, but rather, you know, stitching them together, figuring out what it all means. I, uh, I was tremendously impressed. <laughs> so, so those are those are the uh, my Monday reads for you. It's three recommends. Unfortunately, three huge books <laughs> that are also recommends. There's uh, the British in India. There's the King of the Dinosaur Hunters, uh, and there's the Kremlin Letters, which really doesn't do itself any favors with how it describes itself in its in its outward stuff. The dust jacket, the cover copy, the in my case, the pub sheet. It really doesn't do itself any favors. It doesn't accurately describe what it really is to read. It really is. Uh, uh, well, you, it, it's a it's a history of World War II on the, the leadership level, only with lots and lots of the voice of the leaders. So I don't know what I would have called it instead. I don't think I would have called it the Kremlin Letters. I, I don't know what I would have called it instead, but one way or another. Uh, and then we have uh, the stuff I'll be reading uh, tonight. There's The Sea Around Us. That will be a reread. Uh, and then Are You Okay? A Practical Guide to Mental Health in the 21st Century. And Gods and Robots. Uh, a study of how the ancients viewed technology. And uh, those six books constitute my Monday reads. <laughs> I don't know that I'll do a Tuesday reads, but I figured as long as I'm bombarding you with videos, I might as well bombard you with one more. So there you go. <laughs> and that, I promise, is it. <laughs> no more videos from me until tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you for your patience, book two. <laughs>